Welcome, everybody, to this special event on diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula. I'm John Chorchiori. I'm the director of the International Policy Center and the Wiser Diplomacy Center here at the Ford School. Uh, and this is our lead off event for a Midwest Korea Symposium supported generously by the Korea Foundation. Our symposium gathers students from Albion College, from Wayne State, from Ohio State, and here at the University of Michigan. And tomorrow we'll have some student activities, including uh, an expert panel uh, with experts from the Wilson Center and the East West Center in Washington, as well as a simulation run by the Korea Economic Institute on North Korea. And today's keynote open to the wider UM community will tackle that subject. No one better to share analysis on North Korea diplomacy than our guest today, Steve Began. Secretary Began is a proud graduate of the University of Michigan where he studied Russian language and political science. He has more than 30 years of international affairs experience in the public and private sectors. From 2019 to 21, he served as Deputy Secretary of State, confirmed by the Senate with a remarkable 90 to three bipartisan vote, a rarity these days, but a testament to the, the great respect uh, uh, that, he, that he has earned in Washington. Before that, Secretary Began served as U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, directing U.S. policy and leading diplomacy on North Korea. Among his many other important roles, he served as National Security Advisor to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, Executive Secretary of the National Security Council, Chief of Staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and a senior staff member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Right after the Cold War in the early 1990s, he served in Moscow as the resident director in Russia for the International Republican Institute. Before his recent government service, he was vice president of international governmental relations for Ford Motor Company. It's wonderful to welcome Secretary Began back to the Ford School. He'll start today by offering some brief remarks. I'll then ask some questions to get the conversation started before opening to your questions, which you are able to enter through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So, Secretary Began, welcome back to the Ford School. We look forward to your comments and to a great conversation on North Korea. Well, thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you to the Ford School uh, and University of Michigan, as well as to the Korea Foundation. Uh, this is an excellent and timely subject for consideration. Uh, for those like me who continue to follow North Korea closely, you'll have seen plenty of uh, recent signs that this issue is going to find its way closer to the top of priorities for governments around the world. And so it is a very, very timely consideration of, of what the uh, issues are, how we can tackle them, and, and how we can break through the current stalemate, which quite honestly uh, has persisted since this diplomacy began in 1994, um, with fits and starts and us and others getting close, but not getting across the finish line. I regret, uh, but uh, understand the necessity that we had to shift uh, this conference to a, a virtual format. Um, the symposium would have been great to do in person and, and certainly to do on uh, my beloved uh, home uh, of Ann Arbor uh, at, on the campus, but I recognize it's the case and I think it's probably also a timely reminder of the circumstances and, and conditions that we have to operate in, in terms of international diplomacy. Uh, from the uh, from uh, the approximately February of 2020 through uh, the end of the previous administration in, in, uh, just a year ago yesterday, we were virtually unable to meet with the North Koreans to continue our diplomatic endeavors because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, North Korea reacted with, with one of the most draconian quarantine and isolation policies of any nation around the world truth be known, imposing significant economic penalties on themselves and their own people to do so, but desperate to protect uh, the North Korean population from the ravages of a pandemic for which they had little protection and not much health care to help them uh, in, in the case that the virus began to spread. And so uh, one of the considerations, and, and, and I'll make a few points here in, in the course of my remarks, but the intention will be not just to share some perspective and, and some experience of what what's been tried in the past, but also very much to inform the participants and the remainder of your symposium. We're going to be uh, working through a set of issues tomorrow, um, some of the challenges around diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula to help them uh, put themselves in the place of what are the constraints today and how, uh, how could we possibly undertake the kind of diplomacy that's necessary to resolve the tensions on the Korean Peninsula. So before we get into our exchange, John, 
I thought it would be useful maybe for me to spend a few minutes at talking about uh, three broad sets of issues. The first is some of the, some of the um, choices, some of the um, obstacles, some of the barriers, uh, some of the considerations that, that diplomats have to make as they embark upon diplomacy with the North Koreans, particularly American diplomats. Second, I'd, I'd like to very briefly describe the choices we made uh, in the Trump administration and, uh, and assess on, on where we succeeded and, and where we failed. And lastly, maybe just a couple of, of comments on how this issue of diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula fits into the larger US-South Korean relation, US ROK relationship. I know we have an informed and, and expert uh, community uh, joining this discussion. I'll frequently refer to DPRK and ROK rather than South Korea, North Korea, only because that was that was uh, uh, in not only the training that I had, but also in the case of North Korea, um, they do prefer to be referred to as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And it's become so ingrained in me that that's how I do, but uh, in case uh, uh, that the terminology confuses anybody, which I hope it does not. That's, uh, that's my uh, thoughts. You know, the first question you have to grapple with in, in embarking upon diplomacy with North Korea is who's gonna be at the table? Sounds like a simple question, but it's not. Of course, we wanted to be at the table, the United States, and we wanted North Korea at the table, but the Korean Peninsula is actually a divided peninsula between North Korea and South Korea, between ROK and DPRK. And, and ROK is a sovereign country and we're talking about issues that are fundamental to, to their livelihood and to their safety and future security. And so you have to have the ROK at the table with us in, in that discussion. So when you start into this, you, you start with the US and, and DPRK, then you add the ROK, but then you, then you begin to feel the pressures from the previous rounds of diplomacy and the shared interests in the region from the Japanese and the Russians and the Chinese. And, and fairly quickly, you could get yourself to six parties at the table, the, 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 uh, the, the con construct in, uh, of diplomacy a decade ago was the six party talks. Um, beyond that, you have many interested parties who aren't necessarily in the region, but the European Union, the European Union is very interested. You have the members of the UN Security Council who are interested uh, in, in uh, developments in, uh, uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And of course, um, uh, many of our European countries who are also our allies in NATO or allies like Australia in the Indo-Pacific have a deep interest. And so as you think about who is at the table, you also have to think about uh, how the North Koreans see this. And the DPRK, uh, I think in, in their first preference, would like direct talks with the United States of America. Uh, historically, they've sought to uh, to downplay the legitimacy of, of, of uh, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, and, and also at times North Korea has had tensions with China. And so as we entered into this round of diplomacy, we started with a direct U.S. DPRK negotiation. Another challenge or another, another consideration you have to make uh, is, is how to structure that diplomacy. Um, the Trump administration, as is well known, chose leader level diplomacy as its opening gambit. A, a summit between President Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un in Singapore that produced the first leader level agreement uh, in the history of US uh, DPRK diplomacy. Um, it was long said in rounds of negotiations by uh, North Korean counterparts that if the leaders could agree, then all things were possible. And, and this proposition was tested. Um, there was a uh, there was a four part joint statement released with the commitments of the leaders that I'll come back to in a moment, um, and so the process did start at the leader level. But we also felt it's absolutely essential to have sustained working level negotiations because of the complexity and nuance in these issues, and also mindful of the fact that past diplomatic agreements fell apart because of a lack of detail or agreement on what exactly the meaning or requirements were for the agreements. And so we sought also to layer a substantial amount of working level negotiations led in that case uh, by me and, and my team. Um, there's the question of whether you, uh, in, in that face-to-face -face contact, uh, whether you horse trade, the North Koreans tell you what their priorities are, you tell them what your priorities are, or something they have a very strong preference to, which is you simply write down everything you want them to do 
you write down everything you're willing to do and you forward to that to them and they pick from it like a menu and send it back to you, generally reshaping it to almost be a one-sided set of agreements. And we saw, we had an experience with this during my tenure as well in 2018, after a summit meeting between the president of South Korea and, the, and Chairman Kim of the DPRK, a joint agreement called the Comprehensive Military Agreement was agreed to. It was a set of commitments to uh, reduce tensions on the uh, dividing line between North and South along the DMC, military pullbacks, certain types of equipment not to be positioned, exercises restructured to avoid provocative behaviors. It was uh, on balance, I think a very constructive agreement. I think it took some positive steps like eliminating uh, some of the guard posts uh, that stood between uh, North and South Korea that potentially uh, uh, became sources of provocation in the past. But um, in, in, the, in the end, when you, when you assessed the comprehensive military agreement, it was actually a, ended up being a series of commitments that South Korea made to North Korea. It was very little that North Korea uh, did uh, under the terms of that agreement. I'm not criticizing the agreement because I think it was an important first step and we hope to build on it with some additional commitments that the North Koreans might make in, in later rounds of, of diplomacy. But nonetheless, that's the paper offers where you slide it back and forth. And the risk there, of course, is also you begin negotiating with yourself. You say, hmm, this is asking too much of them. Maybe I should ask for less, or you know, I, I need to offer them this. Maybe I need to offer them more because you know that way then they won't come back. You begin, you begin strategizing and you begin negotiating with yourself. It's a real challenge to, to negotiate through that way versus a face-to-face -face exchange. And within that, within those uh, uh, forms of engagement, there's different models. Um, and these models come with, uh, fraught with political histories of themselves, um, step by step, salami slice, Libya model, all for all, unilateral sanctions relief. All of these things are models that have uh, are tied to uh, lengthy policy debates and philosophical divisions. They, they're under, undermined by lack of trust on both sides. And they each have slightly different nuances in how you would proceed. And step by step, you might say, okay, the North Koreans get rid of 10 missiles, I lift some sanctions. That's a simplistic, uh, that's a simplistic uh, example, but that's, that's step by step. Another way though, step by step is the North Koreans say that in the next 10 years, they're going to get rid of all of their missiles. And they're going to get rid of 10 this year, 10 the next year, 10 the next year. And we're going to lift these sanctions each year in parallel with what they're doing, a step-by-step -step approach towards an agreed end point. Um, the Libya model, uh, uh, which generated a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, storm and drang during my, uh, during my tenure, essentially uh, is, is it, it's, a, it, it's actually a misunderstanding of what happened in the removal of weapons of mass destruction in Libya first. But what it's interpreted to mean is the North Koreans would get rid of all of their weapons of mass destruction first, and then we would consider whether or not to lift some sanctions and improve relations and so on. Salami slice is a description that's usually um, uh, usually used to describe how the North Koreans would like to like to perceive the diplomacy, which is giving the minimal commitment, slicing the salami so thin, and then getting rewarded each time they make a step, always leaving themselves plenty of capacity to reverse themselves. All for all. Which, um, had, which was at least under consideration and got some discussion at the final or the most important summit meeting between President Trump and Chairman Kim in, in Hanoi, Vietnam in 2019. All for all would be, we're gonna lift all the sanctions, you're gonna get rid of all of your weapons of mass destruction, which is gonna resolve all of these issues in one fell swoop. And as tempting as that is, and as much as I would have loved to have seen the, the consensus uh, build around that, it was impossible to believe that the North Koreans uh, would ever do that. Once you get into the um, into uh, you know the, the construct of the diplomacy and and how you're going to proceed, then you have to also uh, figure out how to sustain communication with the North Koreans. So this is extremely difficult. North Korea does have some foreign embassies around the world, but they don't have an embassy in the United States of America. Although they have a diplomatic representation at the United Nations, and that has been the principal way through which the United States has communicated with North Korea in recent decades. It's, it's uh, referred to as the New York Channel. And here the United States uh, the diplomats, the Department of State has a phone number for a North Korean diplomat there. We have a designated person to maintain that communication. 
Usually the calls come from the North Koreans somewhere between midnight and 4 a.m. because they're usually uh, decisions being made and, and directives being issued immediately out of Pyongyang. And so it was not uncommon for our designated communications person to have their phone, cell phone ring in the middle of the night with a message from the North Koreans. But the North Koreans would turn that channel on and off, depending on how happy they were with the course of the negotiations or as a point of leverage to, to try to force us to produce some unilateral incentive just simply to, to resume communications. A, a constant challenge, constant challenge was the lack of communications. And even when we were able to engage with our North Korean counterparts and sit down with them and talk, a significant challenge was the very, very strict limitations that North Korean negotiators were under. Um, when I met with my counterpart, uh, North Korean counterparts in Vietnam uh, a year, uh, almost two years ago now, they had no uh, authority to discuss issues related to the central most important issue for us in the entire negotiation, the elimination of nuclear weapons. They were absolutely un, uh, uh, unwilling and, uh, and, and unable at penalty of, of severe punishment to have any discussion whatsoever on those topics. And so we could discuss a number of other peripheral, important but peripheral issues, but we spent four days uh, uh, fruitlessly trying to get to the heart of the most complicated and, and important matter in, in this diplomacy, but they had a different strategy that their leader was going to come and try to present a, a specific offer to our leader and, and, uh, and close the deal in that way in a manner incidentally that would have been uh, quite favorable to them. Now, one of the things you have to be extraordinarily sensitive to uh, in, in working with North Korea is your, your care and your precision in your communications. Um, I, uh, I, uh, uh, the, the system does not allow any sort of perceived insult or slight, particularly regarding the leadership of their system to go unaddressed, uh, to not address that or to not respond explosively to any perceived insult or slight about their system or their leadership would again lead their negotiators to face the most severe punishments upon their return. But of course, as long as we could maintain a respectful dialogue and have ex that extreme care in how we communicated, we could avoid uh, those kind of flare-ups. And I'm proud to say that we never had a single one uh, during eight rounds of, of uh, diplomatic engagement with the North Koreans. But I also was very mindful that the strength of the United States system is our agility. I could go and sit down in these negotiations and I could test different ideas and different propositions to see if we could make progress and creative progress in different ways. It's something that my North Korean counterparts with their strict instructions had absolutely no ability to do. But conversely, like back home here in the United States of America, I had to deal with a sprawling democratic government and a democratic society in which there were any number of voices constantly opining or stating views or policies on how we should approach North Korea. And this could provide both some the source of confusion and also some opportunity for the North Koreans uh, to exploit, uh, to say that we couldn't deliver on a certain commitment or, or to respond selectively to, to what they heard coming out of the Congress the White House, the State Department, the media, the think tank community, and so on. Our strength in America is our agility in these negotiations. Our weakness is our communications discipline. And the exact inverse is true. The exact reverse is true for the North Koreans. Their strength is their message discipline. They literally only say what they're instructed to say. And they, but they have absolutely zero agility or flexibility in the negotiations. So the way, um, the way that I communicated with them, uh, well, I'll come to that in a moment, just a couple more uh, thoughts on, on, the, on, on, on as you think about how to engage North Korea uh, considerations. I mentioned that the, uh, the central uh, 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 issue for us is denuclearization. And even within denuclearization, the simplest definition would be, yeah, sure, you completely eliminate their nuclear weapons program, and also you eliminate, eliminate the means through which they construct them. But it's far more complicated than that you have the question of verification. How do you verify? How do you prove? How do you have the confidence that they did remove all the technology and, and all the weapons uh, before you begin lifting sanctions and, and, and perhaps even enriching the, the North Korean economy through, uh, through uh, cooperation and assistance? Um, you have a question of whether or not to involve uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which is the gold standard of inspections in, in, in uh, nonproliferation and in, in denuclearization. 
Um, and the North Koreans were extremely wary about the IAEA. So we had to find a creative way to get around their neuralgia for the, for the world's most respected uh, nuclear inspection agency. We had to, uh, we had to uh, grapple with what's called a declaration. How do you just identify the breadth of the program before you begin to dismantle it so that you have on one hand, a list of everything they have. And on the other hand, you then can verify that you've eliminated it. The North Koreans argued that a declaration would it be tantamount to giving us a targeting list in the case that negotiations went sideways and that we could use it simply to use, use force to eliminate their weapons of mass destruction program. The North Koreans were very interested in something that I, I could never bring myself to support, but it has, it has a logic to it and it's worthy of consideration is whether we need to tacitly accept that North Korea is a nuclear weapons state, which it is in a sense that it has nuclear weapons, but, and, and set aside the ambitions to completely eliminate that through denuclearization and instead pursue a strategy of arms control, limitations, reductions, transparencies, et cetera, um, leaving to another day, perhaps a long way away, um, the actual elimination of North Korea's nuclear weapons program. There are increasing numbers of ad advocates for this. As I said, it's, it's not a policy that I would support, um, not just because uh, I am a determined believer in the non-proliferation objectives of the non-proliferation treaty, but also because it would set loose in East Asia nuclear ambitions for other countries who both uh, saw the opening created by North Korea or feared the implications of North Korea being an accepted or tacitly accepted nuclear weapons state. How long would it be before uh, the uh, people of Japan or the people of South Korea or the people of Taiwan began to, uh, demanding nuclear weapons programs of their own to defend their own security and deter North Korea from such an attack. Um, and they also, we also had uh, a challenge that when we talked about denuclearization, we also met two other very serious areas of North Korea weapons programs, biological weapons and conventional and, and chemical weapons, uh, both of which uh, independently uh, posed formidable challenges, uh, both for our diplomacy and for our efforts to bring up bring us a safer environment to the Korean Peninsula. Um, the North Koreans, for their part, uh, demanded a number of, uh, of things from us that uh, are on the front page of the debates today. In fact, uh, uh, I uh, mentioned uh, earlier that uh, this was a very timely session because of the growing tensions on the Korean Peninsula and some recent uh, North Korean short-range ballistic missile tests and also policy pronouncements suggesting, hinting at that they might in fact, unilaterally lift the uh, moratoria that they'd put in place on the testing of nuclear weapons and the testing of long range intercontinental ballistic missiles. The, um, what the North Koreans uh, have constantly called for is the United States to abandon its hostile policies towards North Korea. You'll read uh, again, uh, uh, even in the press today, US spokespeople uh, protesting the United States does not have a hostile policy towards North Korea. We certainly don't intend to attack or go to war with them. But the North Koreans definition of hostile policy includes our joint military exercises with our South Korean allies. It includes the military equipment that we sell and deliver to the South Koreans to defend themselves. It includes US military capabilities to include nuclear capabilities that do exist in East Asia. We don't, uh, we don't uh, have nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula, but we have submarines and we have ships that have nuclear weapons that sail the waters of, of East Asia. We just saw a nuclear submarine surface at Guam, one of the first public sightings of a US nuclear submarine since uh, 2016. Um, these are, these in, in North Korea's views are US nuclear weapons uh, in the theater of North Korea. And then also they complain about further investments and developments in the United States of our own nuclear weapons programs and our own missile tests, putting themselves as equals with us and asking for us to, to take the same steps that we're asking of them. Formidable challenges in the diplomacy, I can assure you. The, um, just a couple of last things on the, on, on the, the, on the diplomacy. One is, is managing the environment that you are in. Um, it, one part of that is the uh, three-dimensional world of first negotiating with the North Koreans, but second, 
managing the, the expectations and the demands of allies and partners in the process. And then the third is uh, as, a, uh, as a representative of the president, the executive branch, uh, answering the mail for Congress, which may have its own views and being, uh, being uh, available to, uh, to come up and do oversight and to, uh, and to face the scrutiny of our elected representatives in the Congress on whether or not our policies uh, in their view uh, are sufficient to defend United States interests. I will say I had excellent interactions with the Congress, but it was aided by the fact that much of the much of the uh, many of the issues that I worked on were uh, highly sensitive and could only be discussed uh, in, behind closed doors in secure settings. But when you took this out of the public eye in that respect, the level of, of intelligent, thoughtful feedback engagement with our members of Congress was extraordinary. They're very knowledgeable. But when you took the political element out, it was a much more substantive negotiation. That's one element of the external. The last element that I want to touch upon is the, is, is the, is the public world in which you're operating, constantly being reported on, uh, constantly having commentary from former uh, diplomats. <laughs> I now fit into that category uh, from experts, from think tankers, um, from uh, 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 political attacks. You know, a diplomacy with North Korea is is controversial. It's controversial here in the United States. I I got my fair share of criticism uh, during our during our efforts, and in South Korea, it's just, it's a it's a central political issue in the campaign for the next South Korean president, uh, the, the voting which will happen in just over a month. Um, and uh, in North Korea policy, North Korea diplomacy is even today one of the one of the most volatile political issues there. Um, there are third parties, uh, third party interlocutors. There's business people, former diplomats who speak to the North Koreans, constantly delivering messages uh, back and forth. Um, uh, and, uh, and then also there's um, uh, NGOs and, 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 uh, and uh, non-governmental organizations who have priorities such as human rights and, and insist that this be uh, awarded a, a sufficient level of attention to respect American values. You know, all of these, none of these uh, are, are um, our influences that are impossible to manage and none of them, uh, uh, frankly, I would be critical of. It's just a complex environment you're operating in when you're trying to pursue diplomacy. Um, I'm gonna come back to this at the very end with just a comment for your, uh, for your students who are gonna be doing the exercise, but let me very briefly tell you the choices we made. So I mentioned we did a leader level approach and then we followed it up with working level. We launched with a, a joint statement in uh, Singapore at President's first summit with Ch uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un. And that joint statement had four specific commitments to transform relations between our two countries, to build a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, to achieve the complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, um, and what was narrowly described as recovering the remains of, the, of, of American soldiers who, who fell and Marines who fell in the Korean War and who, whose remains were not recovered was later expanded to people to people and humanitarian assistance. We tried to deliver fast progress. We wanted to have some low hanging fruit that we could uh, very quickly establish positive momentum. We wanted to set up four separate work streams, one on each of these four priorities that came out of the Singapore joint statement. The way we uh, decided to do this was to have a starting point with some first steps in an end state that defined how it would end. So denuclearization, for example, we would early on get inspectors into North Korea. The North Koreans would freeze the existing program. And then we would set much farther out on the calendar when we would actually eliminate the nuclear weapons program. But the idea was to identify the starting point, the end point, and then work the, work the um, roadmap on how you got from uh, start to finish. The same could be said for transforming relations. We wanted to put, a, uh, put US diplomats into Pyongyang immediately. Eventually, the end state would be the full diplomatic recognition of North Korea by the United States of America. That might've been a long way away and had a lot of other issues, but we would have defined the starting point, the end point, and some early steps to proceed. Um, I know that you distributed uh, for your participants at the uh, symposium, um, in advance, my speech that I delivered at um, Stanford. Let me first say that one of the ways that we dealt with this challenge of communications between the United States and Korea is I only delivered prepared remarks during my tenure uh, as, as um, North Korea negotiator. You'll remember that one of the, uh, one of the locations I chose for those remarks was, uh, was University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in, in, the fall, uh, in, uh, in the fall of 2019. 
Um, John, when I did those remarks, I was, of course, speaking to the assembled students and faculty and interested parties uh, uh, here at the University of Michigan. But my remarks were primarily directed at the North Koreans, and they heard them. I got a response from that speech that I delivered from a podium you know, here at Hill Auditorium on, on the campus of University of Michigan. The North Koreans are listening to everything. But the Stanford speech, the reason why I suggested you share that, and for those of you who haven't read it, uh, I would encourage you to. That was where we were telegraphing to the North Koreans how we want to do this. And I have to say the feedback for that was also quite positive. Uh, so positive that uh, I was, I was uh, in, sitting in Pyongyang less than a week after I delivered that spe speech in Palo Alto, California, and my counterpart had a copy of it on the table in front of him, uh, and we had delivered it to them. The, um, uh, we decided uh, in these different roadmaps, work streams, we were going to pursue uh, parallel and simultaneous progress. That's the main theme that you would have heard in the Stanford speech. And our idea was to advance on improving relations or peace on peninsula or denuclearization or people to people. And if one slowed, the other could carry the, carry the load and, and that we could build a, a multi-vector approach to this that would keep forward momentum even as we ran into difficult issues, which we surely would, especially in the denuclearization. Um, in advance, we priced for what we would give up in return for what we would want the North Koreans to do. If they were going to give us a missile, we were going to give them X. If they were going to shut down a uranium enrichment facility, we were going to give them Y, um, and so on and so on. We priced for everything so that we could parse out um, our leverage uh, in, in a manner that would effectively get us down well down the roadmap of denuclearization. But we were prepared to give them relief if they were making progress on North Korea, excuse me, on denuclearization, as long as they agreed to the end state, as long as we were constantly making progress towards that eventual goal of complete denuclearization. Um, we, uh, we worked very hard internally through all this also to speak with a single voice in the United States government. We tried, we weren't perfect at it, but we did reasonably well. And we did it by empowering the State Department inside the interagency and empowering the special representative, my position inside the State Department so that we could have almost dictatorial control over our messaging, albeit within a robust, uh, sprawling democratic government and also with an entire branch of government that was beyond our ability to control our Congress. So that's what we tried to do. We got very close. And in, in, uh, in I, I, uh, I have to say there were moments in Hanoi, uh, it really, which was the pivotal summit between the United States and North Korea. Um, we had moments where I thought we could get there. Um, but in the end, uh, had, had in part because of some of the confusing messages we were sending, I have to say, in, in all fairness, um, I have to accept that criticism, um, in part because um, even though you want to process and you want to sustain engagement, things kind of come to a head. They reach that, that peak, that, that acne where it's decision time. And when we got to decision time, the North Koreans weren't ready. And I think they weren't ready for a couple of reasons. One is they couldn't contemplate uh, what success meant for their system. And I think that's a fair judgment on their part that if Kim Jong-un, who is a totalitarian dictator, who runs a single party state with extraordinary repression, if he were to broker an agreement that opened North Korea to trade and tourists, that eliminated its nuclear weapons, that brought peace to the Korean peninsula, that uh, transformed US relations and US diplomats and embassy in Pyongyang, it is very hard to picture how that totalitarian dictatorship could be sustained in that environment. It thrives on isolation. It thrives on, uh, quite, quite honestly, it thrives on hardship. And it thrives on parsing out benefits in its society and rewarding and punishing uh, its citizenry. And to think that those tools in that system could be sustained in the aftermath of the type of offer that we were offering the North Koreans, which was a bright future. Um, unfortunately, the North Koreans were prepared to accept that. The, um, the, uh, that's, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer more questions on North Korea diplomacy, but uh, those are the somewhat, I think, somewhat pedantic points that I wanted to share because I do think they're important considerations uh, uh, for your participants in, the, uh, in some of the exercises you're gonna be doing 
uh, tomorrow. Let me just uh, briefly touch on that last point that I said I would, which is where this fits into the US ROK relationship, us and our South Korean allies. First of all, um, the South Korea US alliance is a historic and durable agreement that defends uh, both of our interests on the Korean Peninsula and increasingly in East Asia. Um, it's, it's a vital part of America's national security interests. It's, it's immensely popular in South Korea as well. And I, I'm optimistic that it has a bright future, but it does have some challenges. Um, first, in the course of the Trump administration, and my all credit to the Biden administration, there was quite a debate over how to balance cost sharing inside the alliance. And you know there are two views on this. One is that the United States uh, and is an equal beneficiary of the security that comes on the Korean Peninsula and is that therefore needs to be an equal contributor. Um, a more uh, transactional view, which was held by, uh, by the previous president, was that we are basically uh, there and we need to be paid to be there to defend the South Korean people. And so, so those are two very fundamental points of departure and what the alliance means and, and drove two very different approaches between President Trump and President Biden as to how to resolve the issue of cost sharing. But the Biden administration very early in their tenure successfully did resolve that cost sharing for a five year uh, uh, time frame. And so we have a little bit of time to figure this out uh, before uh, before we have to debate it again. And there are some things we have to sort out. First on the South Korean side, um, very important to them is resolving the issue of when the command of military um, assets and personnel on the peninsula um, falls exclusively to the South Koreans what's called wartime operational command transfer or or uh, shorthand wartime opcon transfer. Um, this is a subject of lengthy debate over when uh, the South Korean military will be capable of commanding the forces on the Korean Peninsula. It's an issue that's very important to the South Korean uh, uh, political class and the South Korean military because they are a sovereign country, it's their country. Um, and, and, and it's one that the US military uh, also has very deeply held views that South Korea has to be able to demonstrate the capabilities and the competence to do so uh, in, in both its, uh, its uh, uh, leadership capacities, but also in its, uh, its ability to manage complex military operations. And so this is a, a subject of, of some tension that needs resolution on the Korean Peninsula. Another issue um, uh, that is uh, important to the United States of America is for South Korea uh, and Japan to resolve their differences so that the United States and its two most important allies in East Asia, uh, its two allied partners in East Asia can operate successfully in a, in a trilateral manner. Another issue that's, that's now bedeviling the US ROK relationship is the, um, is the approach towards China. The United States has is, is made a clear determination that it is going to be a competitive uh, relationship and at times, hopefully not, but at times possibly even adversarial with the People's Republic of China. Um, South Korea has deep economic ties with China. Um, a, a political decision to, uh, to shift in that direction uh, by South Korea has economic implications for South Korea. And also South Korea is, lives uh, uh, very close to, uh, to North Korea as well. And so um, the, the United States and, and South Korea need to have some, some lengthy discussions on aligning what a, how, how we are going to respectively um, uh, work with China or react to China, but also together as an alliance, what is our role gonna be in the larger strategy of addressing the rise of Chinese power uh, in, the, in East Asia? And then there's some other issues uh, such as um, a role for South Korea in the Five Eyes Agreement the uh, intelligence sharing agreement uh, among uh, the leading democracies, but the English speaking democracies exclusively currently, um, that is probably the premier intelligence organization in the world. Um, there's a question of whether or not there's a role for South Korea in the quad that's evolved in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the United States, Australia, Japan, and uh, India. Um, clearly uh, the uh, missing party there is, is India, but is, excuse me, is, is South Korea. But is there a role for South Korea in the Quad? Does it, should it become a quint? Should it incorporate our other uh, um, US military ally in the Indo-Pacific? And then also the recent development of the US-Australia-UK agreement, the AUKUS agreement. Um, 
built around intelligence sharing and building nuclear subs. Um, each of these agreements uh, uncomfortably exclude South Korea. And so as we look at our diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula, we also have to anchor that in a larger US ROK relationship that mm -hmm. is um, capable of delivering on uh, providing security for the peoples of both of our countries. So John, I think I will wrap it up uh, with that. And uh, let's, uh, at, at your pleasure, let's jump into Q&A and then I'll be happy to answer questions from anybody else participating in the, in the uh, virtual meeting. That sounds wonderful. Thank you for those really great and helpful remarks, both in thinking about how to approach the diplomacy as a practitioner and also giving us uh, a very comprehensive view of, uh, of the political factors that shape diplomacy around North Korea. I have a few questions, and those of you who are watching in the audience, you can at any point feel free to enter questions in the Q&A function, uh, which we'll get to in just a moment. But let me start with a few about uh, questions about the most recent events on the peninsula. As you mentioned, North Korea tested some uh, tactical guided missiles this week, the fourth missile test this year, including a few with hypersonic weapons. And yesterday, the North Koreans sent a signal hinting that they may resume nuclear and long range ballistic missile tests uh, that have been paused since 2018. What's the military significance of these tests? And based on past experience, what are their likely political objectives? Yeah. So um, I, I don't think we can be complacent about the, the things that you were describing. Uh, clearly, North Korea is beginning to ramp itself up. And, and, and generally, they tend to have a plan that they've thought through in advance to escalate uh, towards a certain goal. Um, they are dramatically improving their short-range ballistic missile capabilities, without a doubt. And they're spending, by the way, enormous resources to do this. Um, I, I don't have at the uh, at the uh, uh, at the uh, tip of my fingers the number, but it's in the it's in the millions and millions of dollars that they spend for each one of those uh, individual missiles that, uh, to build them that they that they've been testing and firing into the sea. And so you you go back to the probably now two dozen launches that they've done. You just you think about a country enduring such privation and hardship. And at a moment like this, and it's spending an enormous amount of resources, but it's doing so um, uh, with some return. These short range ballistic missiles uh, seem to me to be significant weapons. Um, they certainly uh, have the ability to, to uh, inflict significant harm on the Korean Peninsula to our, to our allies in South Korea. But also, I think it's fairly clear that they can reach a, a sufficient distance to reach Japan. And if you draw a circle around uh, what the, uh, the you know, radius uh, of, the, uh, of the range of these missiles, which I think tends to be around uh, five or 600 miles, um, you certainly, uh, in that circle, you're going to have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of American citizens as well, living, working, operating stationed in military bases in, in the region. So um, the threat of those is, 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 is significant. Um, and, uh, and the question is, uh, and this is debated, uh, if you've been reading any of the recent literature, there's a debate that often breaks out is, are the North Koreans testing these systems to send a signal? Is it a political statement? Or are they testing these systems to test these systems? As, you know, to paraphrase uh, Sigmund Freud, sometimes a missile test is just a missile test. They may just be trying to advance more sophisticated capabilities on the Korean Peninsula. Um, we shouldn't be complacent about it, but um, it, it isn't lost on anyone in the region that short range ballistic missiles won't reach the continental United States of America, not by a long shot. Now an intercontinental ballistic missile will get the attention of a lot more Americans. You remember back to 2017 during the period of fire and fury, and even that, that terrible uh, mishap on the state of Hawaii when the, the person who ran the civil defense system accidentally triggered an alert that a North Korean missile had been fired at Hawaii and caused you know, several hours or at least a lengthy period of panic in, uh, uh, on the Hawaiian islands because of that that mishap, uh, that'll get a lot of people's attention. And the North Koreans know that, um, but it'll get attention for North Korea that it doesn't want as well. Now it's very hard for me to conceive of how we could make the sanctions on North Korea any more um, punitive than they are. We have exhausted the ability of the United States in and of itself to impose pressure on North Koreans, but the Chinese still have significant leverage with North Korea. Whether the Chinese would react 
or overreact to a North Korean ICBM test, I think would remain to be seen. But my, uh, my experience during my period of, of diplomacy, leading the diplomacy with North Korea, in which I worked very closely, I would say even in partnership with Chinese counterparts, um, a nuclear weapons test that uh, really crosses the red line for China. So if I guessed where the North Koreans are heading, um, it very well may be towards an ICBM to really, you know, grab the United States by the collar and shake us and say, you know, you know, start responding to our demands. The problem is we we can't respond to those demands without them sitting down to talk with us, and uh, and it, it 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 is a it is a dilemma uh, how we would how we would do this when the North Koreans have largely given the Biden administration the silent treatment for a full year. That actually gets on very nicely to my next question, which is about sanctions. In response to the tests, as you know, the Biden administration has imposed new sanctions, including travel bans and asset freezes on five North Koreans involved in the nuclear program. And I believe it was just yesterday that China and Russia stalled U.S. efforts to, uh, to multilateralize these sanctions at the U.N. Security Council. How effective, in your view, is the current program of sanctions in shaping North Korean incentives and behavior, uh, and to what extent do China and Russia appear to be enforcing the sanctions that were laid down in that 2017-18 period when there was strong multilateral consensus? So um, the uh, uh, the sanctioning of the five North Koreans was a symbolic action. I understand why in, in the administration I served and there was strong pressure to do that as well. But these five individuals were likely uh, sanctioned for any assets they have in the United States, which they don't have, for any travel outside of North Korea, which they will not do. And so, you know, in, in a way, uh, it, it really is symbolism. It's telling you North Koreans, we know who did it, but because of the overarching sanctions that are already imposed upon North Korea, the, the the practical impact of those sanctions it, it's a it's a political gesture it's symbolism North Korea and, and, and Russia excuse me China and Russia um, both were partners at sometimes uh, challenging partners but partners nonetheless during my tenure as North Korean um, special representative and I have to caveat that my perceptions are, are now one year and one day old since I left government on January 20th of, of 2021 but um, as much as we wanted North Korea and China uh, to effectively implement those sanctions, there were uh, there were large uh, areas of seepage that they could not or would not address. And I, 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 I don't give them too much of the benefit of the doubt because a country like China that can, can control the, the uh, online behavior of virtually every citizen in the country surely should be able uh, to enforce uh, a sanctions regime against North Korea. In the case of Russia, perhaps the capacity is a little bit less but also the will wasn't necessarily there. Uh, but also, uh, and without giving them any uh, any excuse, um, I have to say that you know China and Russia are also the two countries, aside from South Korea, that border North Korea. In the case of China, it's hundreds and hundreds of miles, and in the case of Russia, it's a little bit less. But these are these are uh, uh, easily crossed borders by smugglers and you know some certain amount of seepage, and and then there's just criminality in the uh, in in the world. There's corrupt ship owners and, and you know there's tankers flying under false flag and turning off their communications and, and you know smuggling oil into North Korea. I mean, there's going to be some certain amount of seepage anyway. And because of the proximity of Russia and China, a lot of that seepage is going to come from Russia and China. You know, it's you know, the United States can't control uh, its border for uh, reasonable uh, and, and legal immigration. Um, you know, we have a long border, people cross it. It's just it's just a fact of life. And, and that drives the, uh, some, some degree of the sanctions non-compliance as well. Um, but I don't think sanctions, uh, I don't think we can add much more pressure. The, the Chinese could, I should say that, the Chinese could. But we ourselves, it's not within our wherewithal without the Chinese doing it to add any more economic pressure uh, through sanctions on North Korea. You're right. And, and I have one more question before we turn to the, to the audience. And that is about on the diplomatic side, how to bring the stakeholders together. Right now, we've got Russian troops on the border with Ukraine. We've got intensified tension during the Strait, uh, Taiwan Straits. As you alluded to, uh, 
relations between Japan and South Korea are, are tense. In this context, based on your experience, is it possible for these big powers to compartmentalize and still be able to make serious headway on North Korea at a time when they're locking horns on so many other issues? Possible, yes. Willing is a whole separate question, though. So when I uh, when I uh, uh, took uh, the position at, as the uh, as the chief negotiator on North Korea in the summer of 2018, um, we still had a reasonably cooperative relationship with with uh, China. Uh, in the case of Russia, the relationship had been troubled for quite a long time, and it was further roiled by uh, Russian intervention in the 2016 election. So there were tensions there. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese uh, didn't even need to compartmentalize because they shared shared our objectives. And so we, we were able to, to cooperate even. The Russians compartmentalized and they were capable of doing that. And so so that worked. And, and uh, I remember my counterpart telling me that this was once highlighted in a call between uh, Presidents Putin and, and Trump as one area that the United States and Russia uh, could cooperate. Uh, we lost a, a lot of ground from 2018 to current day. The relations with China are um, are so uh, so embroiled in areas of disagreement, John, that it's not just a question of of can they, but will they? And in the case of China. Uh, from the beginning of the Biden administration, President Biden's approach and his White House's approach, which is very practical, was, um, look, let's let's understand we're going to be competing, but there are areas that we agree on. We should work together with climate change, North Korea, um, you know, what have you. And there are issues that we're just going to have to disagree on and we're going to compete with you. And and the, the Chinese response was no, no, that's not how it's going to work. Either you're going to address all of our concerns or we're not going to cooperate on anything. So it was a conscious rejection of that compartmentalization by Wang Yi and Yang Jinxu, the two senior foreign policy leaders in uh, China. Um, the Russians, uh, Russians might be a little bit more interested, but quite frankly, the Chinese are are the long pole in the tent on this one. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to turn to some questions from the uh, from the audience. And the first one comes from my colleague, Yong Ju Ryu, who is the director of the NAM Center for Korean Studies here at UM. Uh, and she asks about the account of the Hanoi summit contained in John Bolton's uh, latest book, The Room Where It Happened, asking how accurate you say that account is, uh, uh, because Bolton uh, claims credit essentially for foiling an agreement with the North Koreans, um, uh, emphasizes President Trump's or claims President Trump's inattentiveness to the matter and the influence of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in shaping US policy in Northeast Asia. To what extent is that account consistent with what you witnessed? So I didn't read the book. So I will, I, I, what I can tell you rather than refute what uh, John wrote is I can tell you what happened at Hanoi. And um, in, 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 if I really told you the full account, it of course would consume our entire amount of time, but let me get to the critical point which was the failure to reach an agreement. Um, the president, first of all, the president came to this summit as prepared as he has ever been for any international event that I participated in with him. And to that, uh, for that, I credit uh, Ambassador Bolton. I think Ambassador Bolton and the National Security Council staff, um, his Asia director uh, and my good friend, Allison Hooker, spent hours with the president pouring over intelligence reports, maps, information so that the president went into this round of negotiations with Kim Jong-un uh, fully aware of the breadth of the North Korean uh, nuclear weapons complex and program and the size of the arsenal that we suspected they had. And so the president arrived in Hanoi um, fully informed. Uh, Ambassador, where Ambassador Bolton uh, really planted his flag though was he did not want any diplomacy with the North Koreans at all. Flat out, he did. His preferred approach was an ultimatum to the North Koreans that they give up all of their nuclear weapons or else. And it was a very, very difficult time inside the interagency to define what the or else was. In my view, the possibility of, of uh, going to war on the Korean Peninsula uh, to, to face the complete destruction of South Korea in a matter of hours at the onset of hostilities was not a viable option. 
um, it, it is the uh, it, it, it was the dilemma that we faced. And, you know, I, I remember my good friend H.R. McMaster, uh, Ambassador Bolton's successor, you know, saying that um, uh, saying once that uh, you know it, it's wrong to say that going to war is not a choice because it's always a choice. It may not be a good choice. It may be a horrible choice, but it's a choice. But Ambassador Bolton uh, never completed that kind of thought process on. Um, therefore, the approach would be what? Because as I've said, we've absolutely exhausted the sanctions that we could put on North Korea, uh, other than uh, military action or perhaps uh, a campaign of subversion, which would have its own risks, incidentally, because um, if the if the South Korean if the North Korean government collapsed, um, it could be calamitous. Not that we should be supporting this regime, but the rapid collapse of this regime uh, with its uh, huge capacity and weapons of mass destruction could potentially be chaotic and calamitous. So when the president arrived in Hanoi, he wanted a deal. And that that crossed Ambassador Bolton's red line because he didn't want any deal at all. But the president wanted a good deal. And uh, and here I again credit Ambassador Bolton because the president understood when he arrived in Hanoi what a good deal was. And so when Chairman Kim offered him a, um, a proposal, which would be to have us lift all the sanctions that were imposed against North Korea in exchange for one portion of the North Korean nuclear weapons program to be discontinued, but implicitly to allow North Korea to continue to hold its nuclear weapons and to continue to produce enriched material and weapons in other facilities that they might have outside of the facility Yongbyon that they agreed to close. Now, when that was, when that was tabled, the president understood because of his preparation intuitively, that, that was a bad deal. We would essentially become the underwriters of the North Korean nuclear weapons program. And so the president, over the course of the two days, tried to tease out from Kim Jong-un more. At one point, it was, it was almost, uh, I'd paraphrase only slightly here, a question of, can you give, up, uh, give more here or can you ask for less? And Chairman Kim kept robotically repeating the offer that he had brought to the table. And I sat there, I sat there in the back of the room and I thought, oh my gosh, this guy could change history right here. Uh, this North Korean leader, he could fundamentally change the direction of events on the Korean Peninsula, but he couldn't move. He couldn't, couldn't pivot. He had that, didn't have that flexibility as I described earlier. And I think, and as I've thought about this uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, two years since, I still don't think he'd made the decision yet. I don't think he was ready. I don't think he was ready to match what uh, the president was willing to do. So when the president finally felt like he had exhausted those possibilities, he didn't turn to Ambassador Bolton. He turned to the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and he asked the Secretary of State what he thought. And the Secretary of State said, I think we're close, but I think the gap is too, still too big. And the president said to Chairman Kim, yeah, the gap is too big. We've got to close this. Uh, uh, we've got to get this gap closer. Let's have our people continue to work on this. Um, this has been a good meeting. I think we understand each other's uh, views and, and positions, but we've got to just keep working at it and, and let's keep working at it. When we left that meeting, um, our hopes were that, that it would be a, a, an opportunity to build off that and take it further. And everything that was discussed in Stanley Hanoi is still, I think, ostensibly on the table for the Biden administration and the North Koreans. But it didn't die because um, there was a saboteur in the room or, uh, or uh, somebody whose ideological purity was such that they were able to, to shift the president's thinking. The president made that decision. And I was actually very proud of my president that day. He had looked at it and we went into the hold room. We, went, uh, we, we took a break, one last break before we came back to, to conclude the meeting. And the president had all the senior people there, the secretary of state, me, his national security advisor, Ambassador Bolton. He had his senior direct, his, his senior director for Asia, Matt Pottinger and Allison Hooker there. He had um, his chief of staff there, and he went around one by one. He said, "He said, I, I, this is not a, it's not a deal that I, I uh, am inclined to take, but but you tell me what you think." And he went around unanimous view among all the president's advisors. The North Koreans simply weren't ready. They hadn't brought enough to the table, and so that's how it ended. I don't know what I don't know what uh, John wrote in the book. I'm sure it um, I'm sure it was very flattering to the role he played, um, uh, and, and and I do give him a credit, as I said, uh, for some important parts of the preparation. But that's how that's how it played out. Thank you. Uh, very informative. And I want to now combine a pair of. And questions I was in the room. And I was in the room. 
<laughs> I want to combine a pair of questions. One's from uh, one of our great MPP students, Sarah Godek, who asks how the pandemic and, and also uh, the various phases of it have affected China-North Korea uh, relations. And uh, Katie Decker, an outstanding Ford School grad who served in the U.S. government, asks, should we interpret the announcement this week that Chinese brokers say they're, they're going to resume regular trade with North Korea, uh, combined with the recent missile tests as evidence that the North is back open for business and is trying to reassert itself after a, a quiet period amid the pandemic? You know, um, so uh, uh, I was uh, deeply involved in the early stages of the pandemic because, uh, because the outbreak happened uh, initially in China it was an international issue. Of course, our health authorities were involved. Um, I, I was in a daily meeting with Dr. Fauci, Dr. Redfield, and the assembled uh, uh, experts on, on COVID-19, but because it was in China, uh, it was very much a focus at State Department. And one of the early decisions we made was to, to uh, halt travel between China and the United States and hope that we could contain the spread of the virus in the United States. In hindsight, um, it came through Europe primarily into the United States of America, incidentally. Um, so uh, uh, unfortunately, the horses had already bolted. Um, but um, when we, it was a tough decision, but the president made the decision to, to freeze travel or halt travel between the United States and China. And China wasn't happy. Um, they felt like it was ostracizing them. They felt like it was punishing them. And you know, obviously uh, it was uncomfortable. But I noted that there are only one country uh, uh, beat or equaled us with the speed to close travel from China. And that was North Korea. North Korea had immediately closed its borders to China. Now, you have to understand the North Korean population is, is extraordinarily challenged in matters of health. Um, the spread of disease, the lack of uh, immunizations, vaccinations, poor nutrition, a variety of factors contribute to a, to a weakened population without uh, any uh, any any uh, significant health care uh, available to them except in the in the uh, uh, urban areas in particular in Pyongyang but in the countryside tens of millions of North Koreans exist with very little medicine and so if this virus got into North Korea um, it would it would be uh, terrible it would be like the grim reaper people's resistance is low their health care is system is weak and, and it and they were right to be a, a be afraid of the consequences, but they reacted with such draconian, uh, such a draconian response. Their quarantine period was 30 days, for example, things like that, um, that, that were just draconian. They completely closed the borders. And that did start to create some, some additional tension. Not only did China, uh, not only was China unhappy with the abrupt closure of the border, but then uh, over the course of the ensuing months, the North Koreans wouldn't let Chinese diplomats in or out of North Korea or anyone, anyone else's diplomats. And finally, after much badgering and much, uh, much pressure, the North Koreans allowed um, groups of ambassadors to leave. And the reason they didn't even want to let them leave, which you know, ostensibly would not spread virus inside the country was that there had to be some point of interaction at a border or elsewhere. And so we may have even seen the videos of Russian diplomats pushing a handrail car across a bridge from the North Korean border into Russia to evacuate from the, from the Russian embassy in Pyongyang. It's, a, it's an amazing YouTube video to watch. Um, just in recent months, uh, huge tensions behind the scene have grown between North Korea and China because North Korea wouldn't let China send a new ambassador into Pyongyang, again, because of this uh, almost paranoid level of fear of the presence of COVID-19. And so there were tensions between China and Russia, excuse me, between China and North Korea. North Korea rejected Chinese humanitarian assistance. They re rejected trade, they rejected goods. And this, this gets to Katie's question. Second question, the, uh, the Chinese, uh, excuse me, the North Koreans appear uh, from what I can tell from uh, where I sit today, to have put together a sophisticated quarantine facility on the border with China in which goods are literally going to sit out in the open for uh, weeks in order to defumigate and they'll be sprayed and disinfected and this will probably be things like grains and fertilizers and, and other goods. By the way, all legal trade. And just to be clear, while there are draconian sanctions against North Korea, there are large parts of trade that are 
legal and not prohibited by the UN Security Council resolutions, including um, fertilizers, including foodstuffs in particular, and, and uh, many other goods as well. You know, the idea wasn't to starve the population of North Korea and bring it to its knees. It was to, to limit the capacity of the North Korean regime to, uh, to fund and supply a weapons of mass destruction complex. So the, the Chinese um, who fear instability on the Korean Peninsula, I mean, at the heart of this, North Korea, uh, a North Korean collapse would be viewed in Beijing as calamitous uh, as well, not just the chaos and the, uh, the loose, uh, the possibility of loose uh, weapons of mass destruction, but also um, the political consequences and the longer term resolution of the division on the Korean Peninsula could settle out in a way not advantageous to what China per perceives to be its interests. You know, God forbid in Beijing's view that the Korean Peninsula is unified as a democracy and allied with the United States of America. That would be in Beijing, the nightmare scenario that would keep them awake at night. So North Korea trade is important to China to stabilize the uh, North Korean economy. They want to provide food. They want to sustain the regime. They may not want it to thrive, and they may not want it to test ICBMs or nuclear weapons, um, but they definitely, they definitely um, uh, don't want to see the hardships get to such a point that the North Korean regime collapses. Um, Katie, what I would say is the more noteworthy thing, though, uh, when it comes to recent uh, developments in China over the last, uh, last few weeks is increasing mention by Chinese officials that the course of diplomacy should be six party talks. Again, they, they return to that construct I talked about earlier um, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the first few years from during the Bush administration in the uh, early 2000s. Um, that China's beginning to hint at that suggests China, uh, which by the way, the six party talks were led by China, suggests that China is uh, beginning to show signs of wanting to assert itself as the lead broker for uh, diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Uh, I want to shift back to the question of, of how the United States communicates with uh, authorities in Pyongyang or uh, intersects with North Korea. Uh, and Jordan in Corvai asks the question of what role Sweden played in your diplomatic efforts, given that Sweden serves as uh, the U.S. protective power in Pyongyang. Yeah, so um, uh, the uh, Swedish, uh, my Swedish counterpart uh, was a uh, uh, a tremendous partner. The Swedes are trusted uh, by the uh, by the North Koreans. Uh, they have a, uh, Sweden was the first country to recognize North Korea uh, in the aftermath of the Korean War, um, and but North Korea is also, excuse me, Sweden is also a, a well regarded and widely respected democracy in the West, and so they they serve as a uh, perfect uh, intermediary, and they played a very important role in our diplomacy. I have to say that. Um, some of the most important meetings, uh, two of the eight meetings that I had with uh, North Koreans during my tenure as chief negotiator uh, were brokered by and held in Sweden. Um, they uh, they uh, were the authors of the last GASP effort in October of 2019 when we met one, uh, once more, uh, our final time before the onset of the COVID pandemic early the next year. Um, it was not a successful meeting, but it was through energetic diplomacy by our, our Swedish counterparts um, that uh, that we were able to to after the collapse of the Hanoi summit, but then slightly resurrected by the meeting at the Panmunjom village DMZ between the president and Kim Jong Un in the summer of 2019. We were able to pull together one last negotiating round, but at that point, um, for a variety of factors. Uh, I think we were doomed to fail. We tried, but I, I think we failed. But I have to give um, all credit to, to the Swedes. Um, my first meeting in Sweden happened in uh, in January of two thousand uh, January of two thousand nineteen, and they funded a level of security to put us in an isolated um, kind of um, conference center with the North Koreans to be able to have our first substantive, really substantive engagement with them. And the Swedes spared no expense. I, I, uh, I give them great credit. And if we're ever successful in diplomacy with North Korea, um, I have little doubt that uh, there will be Swedish fingerprints on the, uh, on the endeavor. Of course, in addition to a high level diplomatic context, there are other ways that the United States tries to engage with North Korea. And Radhika Aurora asks, uh, to what extent public diplomacy initiatives 
uh, either blessed by or at least tolerated by the U.S. government, have moved the needle on U.S. DPRK or OK relations, such as exchange programs, uh, journalists traveling to North Korea, and so on. They've played a they played an, a, a very very important those those types of initiatives that you described played a very important role in kind of softening the rough, rough edges and finding areas of potential opening uh, between the two societies. Um, I have to say it with with deep deep regret that the COVID nineteen pandemic you know, of all the all the tragic and unfortunate consequences of this terrible virus. Uh, one has been in our ability to engage in effective diplomacy with many countries around the world. I mean, you know, the president of the United States has not sat down with the, with the uh, leader of China a year into his presidency. He's met once with the with the Russian president under extraordinary uh, COVID constraints. It's just and it's just so difficult to advance this kind of diplomacy um, virtually on video links. So. Uh, you know, you mentioned journalists, you mentioned, you know, we have people to people exchanges, exchange students, um, with some risk, we had, the, you know, the tragic, tragic killing of, of Otto Wormbeer. And so you know, there's some risk attendant in, in this, these types of engagements as well. Um, but uh, also track two and track 1.5 dialogues where officials and former officials, or just former officials get together. It generates a significant amount of creative thought sense of where the openings are. It's very important, informal part of communication, and it has uh, delivered uh, on more than one occasion, uh, uh, has given birth to official level engagement. Um, it, for my part, uh, I depended heavily upon it. And, and again, for the last year of my tenure, it was it all went away just with, with uh, every other COVID restriction, you know, for, a, for over a full year, and possibly still to this day, although maybe it's softened now. Not a single person crossed from outside North Korea into North Korea. So any North Korean that would leave North Korea would couldn't come back. I mean, the the the, the pandemic controls were draconian. So um, you know, this was a, this is a huge loss, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get past that. But the, North Korea has a very very low vaccination rate. The pandemic is still raging around us. Um, I, have, I have to say I'm a little bit pessimistic on when we might be able to return to those kind of uh, opportunities. Okay. And, and while the United States is looking for possible ways to re-engage with North Korea, of course, it's also trying to engage with its own allies, in some cases, to pressure Pyongyang. And Will Kyle asks the question of what the United States can reasonably do to help alleviate uh, the tensions and sometimes outright enmity between South Korea and Japan over issues such as the history issue or, or, or trade war uh, issues? Well, I, I have to say that uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a difficult issue um, and, uh, and one that uh, is vulnerable to political exploitation in both systems. It's anchored around a troubled diplomacy, around questions of you know, when is an apology enough? Uh, when is an apology sincere? Um, and uh, I have very, very good friends in Japan, South Korea, that um, that uh, people who I respect immensely who struggle with re resolving their feelings on this issue, um, uh, uh, even now. I had a, I had a respected uh, South Korean interlocutor visiting me once when I was at the State Department, and uh, he was he was trying to explain to me, and there was a moment of, of anger at Japan, and he. And he, he said to me, you know, you have no idea what they did to our forefathers. And I said, sir, just to be clear, you mean what their forefathers did to your forefathers? And that just illustrated for me the fundamental gap that, that it, you know, it was tragic what happened on the Korean Peninsula at the hands of the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, and, uh, but something that the Japanese government have also apologized for and offered con uh, the restitution for. So uh, this is a big challenge for us. These are two great democracies. These are two countries that if we could work and hit on all cylinders together, all of our interests would be advanced in the Indo-Pacific. But um, you know, the challenge of overcoming history is, is one that, that for many cultures and societies uh, uh, that is, uh, is quite difficult to do. So um, I, hope, I hope it can be resolved. But there's continued signs that uh, 
that uh, this remains an area of contention. I mentioned that North Korea diplomacy is a contentious issue in the in the presidential campaign in in South Korea that's underway right now. So is relations with Japanese uh, relations with Japan, um, and I'm afraid it's not going to go in anyway soon. What we really need, what we really need, is some incredibly good statesmanship on both sides to find a way through this issue to permanently resolve it. Thank you. Um, our next question from Julia Fadnelli brings us back uh, across the Pacific to U.S. domestic politics and changes between administrations. From your experience, to what extent do you think North Korea uh, uh, relies on or anticipates uh, differences between administrations and, and responds differently across Democratic and Republican administrations or across different leaders, Obama, Trump, Biden? Uh, or do they tend to present, or do they tend to perceive the United States as having a relatively consistent line toward North Korea? No, you're, you're the, the former, not the latter. They think about our politics a lot. Uh, as, as early as 2019, every time I got together with them, any sidebar conversation was about, you know, who's going to win the next election. And they were intently focused on whether or not President Trump would be continuing in office uh, after 2020. And because, um, um, one of the things that they feel is an advantage for them is they think time is on their side. So if you're Kim Jong-un, who I think just turned 36 years old, and he sees his grandfather, uh, Kim Il-sung, who lived to the age of 80 or so, you know, he's looking at a, he's still looking at a 55, a 45-year horizon, assuming that, you know, the norms of that system are sustained over a period of time. You know, if he's got a, a wait out a president for four years, that's doable. And, uh, and, and, but on the other hand, if, uh, if they are getting into a serious negotiation where commitments are going to be, be made, they want to know that there's going to be a consistent execution and implementation of those commitments across um, the, uh, you know, the number of years it would take uh, to fulfill. And an election could create an uncomfortable interruption in that, as it did, for example, with the uh, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal um, between, it, between administrations. And by the way, that lesson wasn't lost on North Koreans either. So they're they're deeply focused on this, and uh, and uh, and and it's in in the when I said that, that I think you know perhaps the, the uh, final meeting in October of 2019 uh, probably was you know in hindsight not going to deliver uh, uh, much of an outcome anyway. And one of the things that was on my mind that I didn't go into was the fact that North Koreans were already going into a bit of a retreat to see what happened in our presidential elections, which were at that point uh, just a year away. Great. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. And so I'm going to ask uh, two more I've got here. One is from Brendan Flynn, who's uh, joining us from Wayne State for the simulation. Welcome, Brendan. And he asks, you alluded in, in, your, in your opening remarks to the challenge for North Korea of actually accepting uh, the benefits that would come from sanctions relief and trade and the possible destabilization of the uh, of the autocratic regime. What steps could be taken uh, to enable North Korea actually to accept the risks of opening to increase commerce with the world? Yeah, so um, of course there are models that, that they could uh, emulate. You know, as an American diplomat, and anchored in the realities and the responsibilities as an American diplomat. I could never and would never advocate for, no, you can still be a dictator. We'll get this done and you know, your dictatorship will survive. And now, our president did do something that he had carefully considered in many of his communications, particularly the, some of the famous tweets. He would send a message to, to Chairman Kim through, uh, through before he was off Twitter, he would send a message to Chairman Kim and he would often end it with under your rule or under your leadership, that we will transform relations under your leadership. We, he want, the president wanted to reinforce the subtle message that you were not trying to advocate regime change. We had a primary concern here, which was nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. That was our laser focus. Of course, human rights, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the treatment of the Korean Peninsula uh, the people of Korea, North Korea, uh, is, is a deep concern, but the, probably the best thing we could have done uh, to improve human rights in North Korea was find a way to begin the transformation on the Korean Peninsula that in time uh, could soften the, uh, the nature of that regime. But, um, you know, the, um, he, uh, yeah, he, he did have to gamble. 
in order to make this happen. He has, he has to do it because he wants uh, a better future for his people. Um, and we used the sanctions incidentally to compress his timeline. I talked about how he might look at his grandfather's record and think that he's got you know, another 35 or 45 years to, um, to figure this out. Sanctions were intended to compress his timeline, to limit his choices, to reduce, reduce that space that he felt he had, that he can't indefinitely preside over. But it was a careful balance too, because we also weren't trying to starve the North Korean people into submission. And we never believed that sanctions alone um, could impose enough pressure. We just wanted to reduce his choices. But um, you know, at, the models could be emulated as a China model. You know, there's a model in China. There's a model in Vietnam of a single party state, collective leadership. Um, yeah, I mentioned the sense, importance of sensitivity in communicating with the North Koreans. One issue that is almost radioactive, the third rail, is to suggest that there is any system in which North Korea could be governed that is better than the one that they have now, because they have the best one ever now. And if you ever forgot that, uh, you were walking into a uh, hornet's nest with your North Korean counterparts. But the truth is there were other models, something between the totalitarian dictatorship, which I have to tell you, um, it, was, it was in my view, and I, I'm a Sovietologist by background. My background is actually Russian studies, as John mentioned at the beginning. Um, I felt at times like that we were doing the equivalent of a negotiation with the Soviet diplomats in the 1930s during Stalin's terrors in the margin and you know, literally quaking at times in the negotiations for fear that they weren't delivering on their, on their instructions. And so, um, you know, that system, that system isn't going to survive a successful diplomacy, but you know, there's a lot of models for how societies transform themselves and create a better future for their people. Vietnam is one of America's closest friends in Asia today. We don't agree on the nature of their government, but it also doesn't keep us from working together. Great. And our last question actually flows nicely from that. I'm going to combine questions from uh, Joel Wheeler here at the Ford School and Sujin Park, who's our guest expert from the Wilson Center. And they both have to do with how you, how you deal with uh, negotiations with Kim Jong-un or other senior uh, North Korean officials on a person-to-person -person level. One aspect of this is how you, in, in your role as a diplomat, uh, negotiate with somebody who's guilty, guilty of terrible atrocities uh, and whom you may have serious moral and, and personal reservations about. Uh, and the second part of the question is uh, uh, Sujin's reference to another talk uh, you gave in which you, you alluded to the limited knowledge that uh, Chairman Kim and others have about say the IMF or World Bank or other opportunities for North Korea to be able to get assistance. How do you manage to uh, in a sense, educate the person you're negotiating with uh, in a context of such great sensitivity. Yes, yeah, so um, the, uh, I think the first responsibility uh, as an American diplomat is to understand those deficiencies, the, uh, those, um, those uh, uh, you know, deficiencies this isn't even a sufficient word for prison camps and executions and murders and poisoning and so on. You know, go in with your eyes wide open, but uh, you know, keep your eye on the primary objective. If we could eliminate the nuclear weapons program in North Korea, you know, you, one of the things that we are challenged with is, is, is um, a democratic society is prioritizing uh, in our diplomacy or in our international relations. It doesn't have to be a tawdry trade-off. We don't have to ignore human rights, for example, to make progress on nuclear weapons. But we have to sort out for ourselves, what is our primary, what is our secondary, what is our tertiary interest? And can we address those in a way sequentially to resolve and create more opening and opportunity? We had a, a view that our diplomacy with North Korea could be an iterative process where we started out with very little space, but in time, the more things that we could work through, the more space we could create, and we could get to a point where we could have a dialogue, for example, on human rights. And so, you know, you have to keep your eye on the ball. Um, of course, I could have sat there and, and felt 
uh, uh, you know, that, that I was engaging with, with uh, you know, people who had done inhuman things. But instead, I chose to sit down and think about them as humans. You know, many of them, many of the people I worked with were raised within that society, raised within that system. That's what they know. That's what they were born to. Um, did they make trade-offs in their life or choices? Did they choose a course that was personally beneficial over a course that was courageous or honorable or principled? I don't know. Um, it wasn't my responsibility to judge. Um, I had to treat them like human beings, and I did, um, in, in, including and right up to uh, Chairman Kim, who I accepted him for what he was, um, but I also had my eye on the ball on what my responsibility was as an American diplomat. Educating, informing are certainly things that one has to be very cautious of, again, and sensitive to uh, with, with our uh, North Korean counterparts, but sharing experience um, is a very good one. Models of comparison, bad, because again, there's no system that's better than that system in, in their thinking. And it's you're asking for a fight, for example, to make a comparison of how Kazakhstan got rid of its nuclear weapons uh, in, in, and was more secure, at least <laughs> that argument could have been made up until about two months ago. Um, and you can't, couldn't use the Ukraine argument anymore either for that matter. But, um, uh, you know, uh, you teach through sharing experience. You count on, on the tremendous benefit of what was discussed earlier, the track twos, the track 1.5s, the interactions. Um, you know, a lot of organizations, think tanks, um, the United Nations do capacity building uh, uh, discussions where it's not intended to teach North Koreans anything. It's intended for everybody to share and discuss their experiences, but the North Koreans in the room by osmosis and by curiosity absorb and understand these lessons. And it's worked at a number of uh, junctures um, in, uh, in the United States and other countries interactions with North Korea going back, certainly going back to the early 2000s. Um, that's how you do it. Yeah, uh, but, um, but you do it with sensitivity. You do it uh, uh, with um, acknowledging the strictures of their system and their requirements, uh, but you can do it. Thank you very much. Nice note to close on. We've just reached 530. I want to thank you, Secretary Began, so much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you for the participants. Of course, thank you to my staff colleagues, Dan Ellis and Susanna Wisely for organizing this session. And we will, uh, uh, yes, yes. I have one more word I want to say. And this is to your students who are going to be listening tomorrow. I was mindful as I was putting together my presentation today that I was going to give you all the strictures, all the challenges, all the obstacles, all the, all the uh, failed attempts at diplomacy with North Korea. But the challenge that I encourage you to take into your exercise tomorrow is to think beyond those constraints. This is one of the greatest gifts I had as, as a chief negotiator during the Trump administration is for better or for worse, our president was completely unconstrained by all the conventions of what came before. Now, there were times when that, that made a lot of people uncomfortable, but in the case of pursuing with North Korea, we could try anything. And that was very liberating. So as you think through these things tomorrow, don't think about those strictures. Think about what solves the problem, then figure out how you maneuver that inside the system, how you operate inside that environment that I was describing of pressures and inputs and, and confusions and communications, how you work with other countries to build a consensus around it. Um, you know, don't accept that failure is necessarily the only option. Um, that is what my whole team brought to the table every day. And that's why we, we got as far as we did. We didn't succeed. I'll be the first to acknowledge that. But um, understand the strictures, but don't be intimidated by them. Excellent advice for the morning. Students uh, who are part of the simulation, we look forward to seeing you uh, at 930 tomorrow morning for our panel. Uh, um, please, uh, even though we can't see you on screen, uh, uh, join me in thanking Secretary Began for some great remarks, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, John. I'll see you tomorrow.